Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the scriptures teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, good to see everybody in once again, and uh, program number four, and uh, then that'll be it for this afternoon. And again, we like to invite our television audience to get your Bible and uh, compare scripture with scripture and... Uh, Check me out. Now, I already had them catch me on one from the last hour. There was a third Holy Spirit in the Old Testament that I missed. But uh, that's fine. We, we don't mind that a bit. So instead of two, it was three. But uh, nevertheless, the point was well made that we have a tremendous change in modus operandi of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament compared to the Holy Spirit's work in the New. Same person, same third person of the Godhead. All right, now we're in the book of Acts, and we're going to continue on. Now, for those of you who may not have been with us, we're talking about the Pneuma Hagion in the Greek, and this is the Holy Spirit. Pneuma is compared to air. It's invisible. You can't see it, but like the wind, you can feel its effects. All right, so now then what we have to do as we go through Scripture, and that's what we did in our last program, are we talking about the person? the Holy Spirit, or are we talking about his power, as Jesus called it, the power from on high? Now, I'm sure that most thinking in Christendom is that the person is indwelling us. Well, I think from all these verses we're showing you now, no, it's not the person, Holy Spirit, it's the power of the Holy Spirit that is within us. And it's the power that makes the change in our lifestyle. It's the power that gives us understanding from scriptures. And uh, in fact, I may have referred to it in my last taping. I think I did, but it bears repeating. We uh, met a couple down in Florida last spring who came out of Mormonism and uh, were dyed in the wool, Mormons. But uh, they came to know the Lord and just have tremendous testimony. And uh, they stopped by the ranch. Now, well, it was several weeks ago. And uh, they spent the afternoon with us. And in the process of our visiting, I asked, how could two intelligent people like you be steeped in something so false as Mormonism? And his answer was perfect. Well, he says, until the Spirit enlightens you, you don't realize that you're wrong. And that's exactly right. See, it's the Holy Spirit that has to open up the understanding. And as he said, you don't really get that until you're saved. And then as soon as you're saved, it just keeps opening up more and more and more, and you just can't exhaust it. And so this is what we have to realize, that when we're dealing with the lost world, they really can't comprehend this until the Holy Spirit convicts them enough that they take the time to see what the book says. Until that happens, you know it, you've experienced it. They don't want to see it. You can tell them, well, let me show you some scripture. I don't want to read it. Why? Because they still do not have enough <coughs> spirit enlightenment to have any inkling to want to see these biblical truths. So this is where we have to be patient. All right, so now for this half hour, we're just going to keep going on through our, our New Testament references where we have this constant referral to the Pneuma Hagion, the Holy Spirit. But we're going to differentiate, is it the person or is it that power from on high? All right, let's just come on over. I thought I was back in chapter 5, and I'm not finding the verse that I wanted. And... Um, so I guess I'm just going to have to skip from that one and go right on over to chapter 10. Chapter 10, the book of Acts. And here we have Peter now <coughs> ministering to this house full of Romans, military at that. Now, you know, there wasn't much spirituality in Roman military, was there? But uh, yet, miraculously, you see, the Spirit worked upon Cornelius, 
and uh, caused him to send some of his underlings down to find Peter, brought Peter up, and of course Peter was still on the same premise that he had from the time of Christ's earthly ministry, and that was what we call the gospel of the kingdom, and that was that Jesus was that promised Messiah and coming king, period. Even though he had now been crucified, buried, and risen, Paul, uh, Peter does not proclaim that for salvation. All Peter proclaims is that even though their king had been crucified, he had been raised from the dead, and he was still capable of being the king. And so that's why it's called the gospel of the kingdom. Now again, a lot of people get all confused. They think that's still a valid gospel today. No, that was just for a few years during the book of Acts. And Israel, in their total unbelief, rejected it, and it just fell through the cracks, and it disappeared. And if you are aware of Scripture at all, after Saul's conversion, how much do you see of Peter in the book of Acts? None. He's totally disappeared from view. Why? Because it's a change in program now. Israel has fallen away in unbelief. God's going to set them aside now for 1900 some years. Not through with them. Oh, he's still going to come back and finish with his prophetic program. But by the time we get Saul's conversion, Peter and the Jewish program just disappears from view. And if it weren't for Peter's little epistle, we wouldn't hear anything from him again because Paul now fills the stage. But here in chapter 10, we're still dealing with Peter. And uh, God has seen fit to use him to open the door to Gentiles. And I think it was more for Peter's benefit even than for Cornelius, because, as I've said so often over the years, had Peter not had this tremendous experience in the house of Cornelius, witnessing with his own eyes that God was saving these pagan, immoral, military Romans, the moment they believed, without repentance, without baptism, the evidence was there. All right, here we pick it up now then in Acts chapter 10, verse 44. <clears throat> and so while Peter yet spake, the Holy Spirit fell on all them who heard the word. Now, we don't know how many were in the house of Cornelius, but it was an average Roman house, so you couldn't have had hundreds. There might have been a dozen, I just guess. Maybe not even that many. But however many there were, as Peter preached, presenting as Israel's Messiah, this Jesus of Nazareth, who had been crucified, but God had raised him from the dead, and he was still in a position to come and set up this glorious kingdom. All right, before Peter had ever finished then, the Holy Spirit fell on these Romans. And now look at verse 45. And they of the circumcision, these Jews who accompanied Peter. Now, we've got to find them over in chapter 11, verse 12. So we better look at it. Chapter 11, verse 12. And Peter is rehearsing all this to the church at Jerusalem who got all over him for going up to a house full of Gentiles. And so Peter is rehearsing with them, and I'm just using this to show you who these men were that were with Peter. Verse 12, so he says, The Spirit, again, the Holy Spirit, bade me go with them, nothing doubting. Moreover, these six brethren, see, fellow Jews, these six brethren accompanied me. And we entered into the man's house. Okay, so that's who we're talking about in Acts chapter 10 now then, verse 45. These six Jews who went up there with Peter, and they were believing Jews, members of the Jerusalem church, and they were, what? Astonished. Man, they couldn't believe their eyes. That here Peter hadn't even finished preaching. They haven't repented. They haven't been baptized. But yet they've got the evidence of the Holy Spirit. Unbelievable. And so they were astonished. This has never happened before. And so they were astonished because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the, what's the next word? The gift. See? 
not the person, the power from on high. Oh, I love this. Because this makes sense. This makes sense. The person of the Holy Spirit isn't indwelling every believer, even though he is omnipresent, but it's his power, see? It's his gift. And that's what was poured out here, that they received the gift of the Holy Spirit. And here was the evidence, and we're going to see it again in Corinthians if we have time. For they heard these Jews now, Peter and the six Jews, for a total of seven. See, God always does things according to his numbers. And so these seven Jews were astonished because they heard them speak with languages that they knew was not of the ordinary. It was a supernatural thing. And they heard them magnify God and then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these men should not be baptized who have received the what? Numahagion, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Not the person, the gift, the power from on high. All right, now then let's just come on over to chapter 13. Now we're going into another area of the work of the Holy Spirit. Paul and Barnabas have been ministering up there in Antioch. Gentiles are coming in. And now Paul is exercising his authority as the apostle of the Gentiles now for the first time. But now we get into chapter 13, which was about a year and a half after he had been brought back to Antioch. Verse 1. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch. Now this, I feel, is a body of Christ, predominantly, not exclusively, Gentile believers. So there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, such as Barnabas and Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, and Manian, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. Now, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit, now what's the next word? Said, who are we dealing with? The person, see? The person of the Holy Spirit. He speaks, and he speaks in a way that they could understand because he said, separate me Barnabas and Saul, or Paul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Spirit. Now, what part of the Holy Spirit? The power. See? The power from on high is now on Paul and Barnabas as they go out on their missionary journeys. And so they departed in Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. All right, now let's look at the next one, and that's going to be in chapter 13, and we're going to come all the way over to verse 52, but let's start at verse 50. All got it? I'm trying to figure out where they are. I should have known. But anyhow, in verse 50, the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city. I think this must be up there in uh, Thessalonica. But whatever. They're over there on the, island of, uh, on the land of Greece. And the Jews stirred up the devout and the honorable women and the chief men of the city, and they raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coasts or their borders, their city limits. And Paul and Barnabas shook off the dust of their feet against them and came unto Iconium. No, that's up in Asia Minor. I'm sorry. And the disciples, that is these converts now of Paul and Barnabas who had heard Paul's gospel, and they had now become members of the body of Christ. And how do we know? 
because they were filled with a person? What? Joy. See? And with the Holy Spirit, his power, his gift. And that's why they were able then to resist all of the pressures of the persecution that hit these new believers the minute they made themselves known. And so it was the power of the Holy Spirit that carried them through. All right, now let's just move on over to chapter 15, verse 28. And this, of course, is after that Jerusalem Council. And uh, we know from church history that this Jerusalem Council took place at 51 A.D. And so that's about 11 years after Paul has begun his missionary journey. And so they have decided, Peter, James, and John, that they would stay with Israel, they would stay with their Jewish economy and their gospel of the kingdom, and Paul and Barnabas could continue to go to the Gentile world with Paul's gospel, as he calls it, over and over. Now, let me make a verse. Somebody at break time just reminded me of it, and I think it behooves us, even for our television audience, to see what we're talking about when I speak of Paul's gospel. Romans chapter 2. Now, this is a little bit of an aside. We're going to leave our thoughts on the Holy Spirit for just a moment. <coughs> but since this is associated with that Jerusalem council, and James and Peter and John are recognizing that the Holy Spirit is the leading power to recognize Paul's apostleship of the Gentiles. All right, in Romans chapter 2, verse 16. Now, this is a verse that most people don't even know is in here. You can show it to your Sunday school people, and they've never seen this before. I'll guarantee it. They've never seen it. But here it is. Romans 2, verse 16. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men... By Jesus Christ. Now, I feel this is a reference to that great white throne that we looked at in one of our previous programs this afternoon, where Christ is going to be the eternal judge of all the lost of all the ages. But in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, who is the judge, according to my gospel, Paul's gospel, and he speaks of it over and over. My gospel, or that gospel which I preach. Well, now we've got to qualify. What's he talking about? So again, we'll put the Holy Spirit on hold for just a moment and come on over to 1 Corinthians. One of my favorite texts. I have to use it because nobody else does. And I can't figure out why. Don't you? Why don't they use it? I still haven't figured it out. I had a good article sent to me yesterday again. First thing, I'll go right on down through it. They got everything but 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. And he was a good man. The rest of his article was A-OK. -okay. But it's just like somebody just blocks this off. And I'm going to keep hammering away because of the language. Verse 1. Moreover, brethren, He's writing to Gentile believers at Corinth. I declare unto you the gospel, the one and only. Yes, it's inclusivistic. God is particular. In fact, I was just sharing with someone. I don't remember whether it was person to person with someone or on the phone. If God, if God were to let someone into his heaven by compromising any part of this gospel. Could he shut the door and say, well, that's all? My, once you get a door open, can you ever close it? No. And so he can't. He can't let one slip in, except by his own 
divine requirement. And here it is. This is it. And why is this so hard for people to swallow? Basically, it's what they're going to agree to, but they're going to add a lot of garbage to it. But this is it in its simplicity. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, the one and only, which I preached unto you. Now, you want to remember, Corinth was a pagan, ungodly, wicked, Gentile city. And he says, which also you have received. They believed it. And wherein you stand, that is, positionally in their faith and their relationship with God. Now, verse 2. By which you are, what? Saved. Now, is that so hard to understand? What does the gospel do? It saves people. And they don't like it. All right? But this gospel is by which you are saved. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, lest you believe in vain. Now, somebody just asked me this afternoon, what does that mean? Well, you've got to believe the right stuff. You have to believe what this apostle is laying out in front of us. And here it comes. This is what we are to believe. And most people are not even hearing it anymore. See? All right? Verse 3. This is Paul's gospel. For I delivered unto you, you Corinthians, you Gentiles, you pagans, I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. Now you to go to Galatians chapter 1. Where did Paul receive this gospel? From the ascended Lord. Ascended Lord revealed it to him and instructed him not to take it back to Israel, but take it to the Gentile world. And all of Paul's doctrines flow from this gospel. See? All right, read on. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins. Well, what have I been stressing these last four, five, seven programs? The incarnate Christ and his finished work of the cross. And that's Paul's gospel. That this Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God, the creator of everything, died for our sins, according to the scriptures. And he was buried. We know three days and three nights. And that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's the gospel. Now, why is that so controversial? But, oh, they don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear it. I hear it day in and day out, letter after letter, phone call after phone call. They don't want to hear it. But this is Paul's gospel. All right, now then, where was I? Back in Acts. And so he's been meeting with the 12. Matthias has now filled it out again, back in Acts chapter 15. And, uh, no, I was further than that, wasn't I? Oh, yeah. Yeah. In 15.28. Acts 15.28. I'm sorry. And this is just after he's been meeting with Peter, James, and John up there in Jerusalem because of the Judaizers that were coming behind the apostle and telling his Gentile converts that they couldn't be saved by Paul's gospel alone, just like you're hearing today, but that they had to embrace Judaism, circumcision, keeping the commandments and all that. All right, so now Paul and Barnabas finally make their point, and, of course, the Spirit of God in, uh, enlightened Peter and James and John to recognize that, yes, Paul has a ministry all his own to the Gentile world with a whole new program, the gospel of the grace of God. All right, so verse 28. Peter says, as he's now rehearsing it to his own church people in Jerusalem, 
For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things that you abstain from meats and offered to idols from and so forth. But uh, the word I want you to see is up there in verse 28, that it was the Holy Spirit's leading to send this decree back to Paul's uh, Gentile congregations. All right, now let's move to the next one then. In chapter 16, verses 6 and 7. Now we're moving along through Paul's journeys, remember. And we're just simply looking where the Holy Spirit comes to the surface all the time. He, he's, he's the power from on high as well as that third person of the Godhead. But it's up to you and I to determine from the text what is it talking about? Is it the power from on high that indwells us, that is within us, or are we dealing with the giver, the person? Okay, so now then in chapter 16, Paul is now on, I think, his second missionary journey already, and they're approaching the Aegean Sea from the east, their western Turkey, and they had intended to turn and head back east, back to Asia, but uh, the Holy Spirit now makes his appearance. Verse 6, So now when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia, which is up there in central Turkey, and they were forbidden of the Holy Spirit, person or the gift? Person. Person. The Holy Spirit, the person, reveals himself now to the apostle and says, no, I don't want you to go back to Asia. And so the Holy Spirit forbids them to preach the word in Asia. Verse 7, after they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go into Bithynia. Again, going back east along the northern part of Turkey. But the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the person, permitted them not. And so we have to understand here that this is the very great difference again between the giver and the gifts. And so now we're running out of time already and we're going to have to wind it up there. But you can do this on your own. As you go on through the, uh, the New Testament, you just constantly see this reference to the Holy Spirit. Always the pneumahagion. But is it the gift or is it the giver? Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552 or call 1-800-369-7856. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felding.